You're in for a rare treat. The Black Cultural Center, in conjunction with Purdue Convocations and Lecture, is proud to present Kwanzaa, First Fruits from Africa to America. My great-great-grandfather told me, my grandfather, who told me this story that I'm going to tell you. There was a young man named Adali, son of a chief who was nearing the age of the rites of passage. He knew the ceremony, he had to, for every male must go through it, and he had witnessed his brother's ceremony. He had talked among those he had gone through it with him, and they were all prepared to go through it. It was going to be a whole week. And this week was to be used to train their bodies. They used them to train their bodies. To train the body to ignore pain. So they swam until their muscles cramped and they swam and swam and swam. They ran through the briar patch and they suffered each cut separately. Oh, they cut their faces and marked them, and poured white powder into the burns. Each cut was made with a small knife and packed with ceremonial powder. They also knew that to cry, well, to cry, to cry was just out of the question, though it showed a sign of weakness. It showed that they would be unfit to join the village of men. As was traditional, everything was under the watchful eye of a papa, that old sage. His job was to train these young men, train them to be men. And now the day had come. The day had come. The sun was shining on the hard baked clay. The men were encircled by the ceremonial block in their traditional dress. Each had his mask on. Ayodele walked into the circle to the chants of the men and answered in response to their call. He watched the priest, the chief priest that was, as the sun flashed on the knife that was in his hand. He walked toward, toward, forward, forward, watching the knife, remembering that he had to be strong. He could show no pain. As he stood in front of the ceremonial block, he bared himself before the priests. He closed his eyes and rapidly chewed, chewed rapidly the pain-killing leaves. Suddenly there was a blind flash of pain, pain. He felt himself being led to the water where he would be bathed so that when he emerged, it would be known throughout the village that he indeed was a man, a man of the village. And now it was time to sleep. Tonight the dance would begin and he would save his strength for the run.
Elder's life is now complete, or so he thought it was, he said to himself it was, and now he was a man of the village, a man of the village, and one of the great standing, especially since, uh, since his father was the chief of the whole village. As was the custom, he now owned part of his father's cow. His father gave it to him as a present, a present for his becoming a man. Ayodel dreamed of the son that he would one day have and how the herd he would pass on would be even greater than his father passed on to him. Already he had made a deal with the northern villager, you see, which he would help to uh, increase his herd great, greatly. Well, from a small beginning, but nevertheless, a beginning. Ayodel's daydream were interrupted by his uh, new wife as she came out of her thatched hut on her way to the river to draw some water. Ayodel uh, could not help but feel proud of the way he watched his wife as she swayed slowly back and forth. Well, she wasn't quite the prettiest girl in the world, but he would not be interested in that anyway, in fact. For he knew that all of her strength was not on the outside. Somalia had a beauty that came from within. She was a very beautiful girl, therefore. But it went so much deeper, so, so, so much deeper than that. For Ayodel knew that Somalia would always be at his side, always that she would bear him strong sons and daughters, just as beautiful as rain. But now was not the time for daydreaming, my God. I mean, there was much to be done for the days ahead, the tending of the crops, the making them ready for the harvest, the preparation of the dance that would follow in the next few days, and the grooming of the bulls for the big upcoming trade. Ayodel looked around his village and saw in front of almost every hut a young warrior preparing his weapon for the dance to show the chief that if there should be war, they would be ready. The temple knives of the harvest were now getting their keenest edge. The small wooden shields were oiled and polished, polished until all reflected in their gaze. The spears were balanced and rewrapped with their cord, new cord. But then there would still be in the morning games, games, right up to the day of the dance that would help to put the body in shape, the body, just as the weapons were. Now Yodel absentmindedly felt the blade of the knife, the sharpness of it, reminding him that he should have done that. As if on cue, his wife came up and gave him a drink of water that she brought back. Then she quietly slipped into the hut, leaving him at his work. Ayodel smiled and stuck out his chest a little more. Not only was he the prince in his own right, you see, but he had a queen, a strong queen, to stand beside him. And there could be nothing better to have a queen standing beside you when you're preparing for war. If your woman does not stand behind you, lend her weight to yours, then the battle is half lost. Because you only fight for yourself. And that is very hollow. And you have no one to share your victories with. In the distance he hears the chants of Hamba. Humba, not a word, but a sound. Humba. That means to shake. Tremble. It is our sound as warriors as we prepare for war.
Smola leaves, she bides and bids and binds and bids her husband goodbye as he journeys to the north there to sell his bulls and begin his fortune for his son, you remember. The harvest is now over and Somalia, along with the other women of the village, must go to the village square. And they must go and begin the preparations, the preparation of food that was to come from the fruitful, fruitful harvest. everybody. Jambu is a Swahili word and it means greetings. It's always a pleasure to be here amidst all the many great minds that are here striving to do something very meaningful in life. Seeing that we're celebrating Kwanzaa, which is not an alternative to Christmas, but it is an affirmative to the fact that we do have something that we celebrate and deal with in regards to the first, the first fruits. So tonight, let us share our energies. At this time, I'd like for you all to help me. And as you all know, there's nothing better than skin on skin. So let us put our hands together. Now I want you to remember two things. The first, the rhythm that I give you, which will be.
Yeah. Ah. Oh, oh, I shake. I shake. <laughs> Almost forgot about the second thing. Now, the second thing, there's going to be a cutoff. No county. Feel it. The cutoff is going to be, I'm going to play it, but I'm going to say it now. The cutoff will be gang, 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 gang. That last note is when I want you to stop. Now, after you stop, some people count it like four. They say, gang, 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 one, two, three, four. Back into the rhythm. So let us try that right quick to make sure that we have it. Don't have it. Now we're going to get it this time. Now watch, watch me. I'm going to sing the cutoff while I'm playing. I hope. Gang, 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 gang. All right. One more time. Almost. One more time. That's better. Now, I want you to. It's going to come. But you have to listen. That's the that we do. Being the first, the first bits of energy that we share together, bringing on the new year. Let us take this time to recommit ourselves to the struggle that is happening all over the globe. Mm -hmm. Kwanzaa, not replacing anything, but has its rightful place naturally. Kwanzaa. Now when I play the cutoff, I will speak to you in the language of the drum. So when you cut off, continue to listen.
Out of the yard, I had to take the bulls, the herd of bulls, to the market. So early one morning when the market was open, the car gets all of his bulls together and he takes them, he walks them, he goes to the market. Five miles away, when he reaches the deepest part of the jungle, he hears what becomes an aware of a strange and unusual sound. Hissing sounds, whispers, and quiet footsteps begin to surround him. He looks up at the sun and before he knows what's happening, some people pounce upon him. They pounce upon him, and although he attempts to fight them off, and really fight them off, he is overpowered. They repeatedly hit him on the head, and he soon collapses and lapses into unconsciousness. Upon awaking, Ariel finds himself bound and gagged, bottom of a ship, swaying, destination unknown, and after what seems to have been weeks, the ship's movement finally ceases. Within minutes, two strongly built men come down and they bring him up. What Ariel sees when he's brought to the deck of the ship is what is, well, this most magnificently beautiful sight, green landscape, the most beautiful sight he'd ever seen. Tall palm and fruit trees, as well as glimmering white sand, beaches. All this startles him because he is unaccustomed startles his unaccustomed mind. He stares in awe at the island, in awe at this island's unimaginable beauty. He is brought to the West Indies as a captive, and he is the captive of the great black emperor Halusi. 